our scripture reading this evening is found in the gospel according to Matthew. Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. We'll begin verses 1 to 16. Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is our, the word of the Lord. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in, poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that you may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's again turn once more to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we would come before you this evening, Father. We would thank you for your word. We would come with the psalmist of old who would say, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is my delight. Your word is my treasure. And we would come and we would speak the same way, Lord. Your word is precious. And your word is true. And we would say uh, with the songwriters, speak, O Lord, through your word, through your preacher, by your grace. We need to hear from you, Lord. Lord, in a dry and weary land, we need to hear, Lord. We pray for all the audience, everyone hearing uh, on YouTube or wherever it may be, Lord, or wherever they watch this, whenever they watch this message, may they hear you speak, Lord God, clearly through your word. Lord, we pray for those that are uh, downcast, depressed or anxious, battling uh, thoughts uh, of depression or suicide or whatever it may be, Lord. We pray you would be, be with them, Lord. Be with especially your people who are struggling with whatever kind of illnesses or diseases. Lord, be with them, we pray. Lord, we pray for, uh, Lord, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Lord, please, Lord, raise up more people for the harvest. Help us, Lord God, in these times when we're at home where we could be easily distracted. Help us to be more disciplined, to study your word, to, to awaken in the morning and to spend time with the Lord, to take time to be holy and speak often with the Lord. Help us in these times, Lord. We're, these times are rare. Help us in these lockdown measures, Lord God, to continue to put you first to speak of you to others, Lord God, to make your name known to, throughout the earth. And Lord, we do pray that you would continue to guide us, continue to be with the Arabic and the English congregation. Help us to walk in your way, not to turn to the left or to the right, but to keep walking steadfast, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Lord, we pray that Christ would be exalted this evening. Again, we pray that you would be with uh, Dr. Costa, Costa and you would help him, Lord God, as he brings the word forward. We thank you for all that you do and all that you have done. Continue to be with us, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. This evening we have a special guest. He is, uh, his name is Dr. Costa, Tony Costa. He is a professor uh, at Toronto Baptist Seminary as well as Heritage uh, Bible College and Seminary. He's also a professor 
well, he also teaches at University of Toronto and other places, which are too many to count. But we're glad to have him here with us uh, this evening. Welcome aboard, Dr. Costa. Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, and it's a great joy for me to be here this evening. And thank you again, Brother Morad, for extending the kind invitation for me to be here. As we heard from the Word of God, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, I'm going to be focusing mostly on verses 10 to 16, but this selection of Scripture comes to us from a part of Scripture that we know as the Sermon on the Mount, and that comprises chapters 5, 6, and 7. And this part of Scripture is a favorite among many, and Many secular people will usually go to this portion of Scripture and say, this is what I really like about the Bible. I like what Jesus says here in these, in these teachings. And they are attracted to passages like, judge not lest you be judged. And yet, this whole Sermon on the Mount, which is beloved by many, is not intended for the world. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon, a teaching that Christ gives to the citizens of his kingdom. And we know that because in verse 1 of chapter 5, we're told there that when he saw the crowds, as they went to him, it says he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, notice verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them. He taught the disciples what he's going to teach here. So this is not a general philosophy 101 course for the world. These are teachings that the Lord Jesus Christ has directed specifically to his disciples. I want you to notice Matthew says that he went up on a mountain. And this is deliberate. This is important. Because what Matthew is trying to do is Matthew maps out for us in his gospel the life of Jesus as the new Moses. If you remember when Moses was born... In Egypt, you'll remember that King Herod, uh, rather Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had called for the execution of all Hebrew children two years and under. When Jesus was born, you'll remember King Herod also ordered the execution of infant children two years and under. And just as the people of Israel went into Egypt and became slaves there and then were rescued out of Egypt by God's mighty hand, you'll notice Jesus and his family, when he was an infant, they fled into Egypt to be protected from the wrath of Herod. And then he came out of Egypt, just like his people did. And of course, the people of Israel went through the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted for them, and, and God brought them out. And how did Jesus begin his ministry? He went through the waters. He was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And immediately after the crossing of the Red Sea, the children of Israel go into a 40-year temptation narrative process. You remember the narrative, the process of the wilderness wanderings for 40 years. And immediately after Jesus' baptism, what does he do? He goes into a 40-day uh, fasting period into the wilderness, just like the Israelites did. And when the Israelites failed God in the wilderness by disobeying him and bringing down his wrath, Jesus won, if you will. He won that, that, that conflict between him and Satan, where Satan threw everything at him. Jesus conquered on every point. And if you remember... All the temptations that Satan threw at Jesus were the very same temptations that were thrown at the Israelites. When they were hungry, they clamored to Moses that you brought us out here to die, and then God mercifully and gracefully sent down the manna. Satan tells Jesus, you know, those stones, they, they look like loaves of bread. If you're the son of God, turn them into bread. And Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. Each of the temptations of Jesus reflect the temptations in the wilderness. And so what is Matthew doing? He is saying here, that Jesus is the true Israelite. He is the true son of God who obeys God, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king who is not disobedient, but he obeys the father, is not ready to tempt the father, but to obey and subject himself to the father. And then immediately after, of course, the 40-day fast period, we're told that Jesus went proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and proclaiming liberty to the captives to set them free. Just like Joshua was told by Moses, when you take the people over into the land, proclaim liberty throughout the land, proclaim freedom throughout the land. And so here's Jesus going up on a mountain, just like Moses went up on Mount Sinai. And Moses went up on the mount to receive the law from God. 
And so Jesus here, God incarnate, goes up to this mountain, and what does he do? He delivers to us the new law, if you will. The, the magnification of God's law is brought about in the teachings of Jesus. And so he tells his disciples that this is what my kingdom is going to look like. My kingdom is going to be a kingdom of peace. It's going to be a kingdom of the peacekeepers. Those who are pure in heart, they are the true sons of God. Those who are meek, they're going to inherit the earth. Those who are poor in spirit, they are going to be filled. Those who, are, who mourn, they're going to be comforted and so forth. But I want you to pay close attention to verses 10 and following. He says, he concludes the Beatitudes. These are known as the Beatitudes because these are the blessings. Every, every sentence is preceded by the word blessed, the Greek word makaroi, and it means blessed, happy, the Beatitudes. And he ends it by saying this, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is telling us that his citizens of his kingdom are going to be persecuted. It's a guarantee. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12 that all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not a maybe. It's not a possibility. It's a guarantee. If you follow Christ, you will be persecuted. Now, if you're saying, well, you know, I follow Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I've never been persecuted. Well, the answer is very simple. You've never opened your mouth and told people that you follow Jesus Christ. You haven't shared the gospel with anyone. Because the moment you claim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and King, immediately the world turns against you. Immediately the world will turn against you and say that you're, you're bigoted, you're hateful, you're one of those fundamentalists, you're one of those weird born-again Christians that all you care about is money and, and ripping people off and so forth. And Jesus says, there's a cost for following me. You're going to be persecuted. And if you're not persecuted, it's because you haven't said anything. And if you haven't said anything, it's because you're either too embarrassed or because you just don't want your friends to leave you. And what did Jesus say? He said, if you're ashamed of me in this evil and adulterous generation, I'm going to be ashamed of you. If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father and his holy angels. The angels will act as witnesses against you in a jury to testify that you denied him. Like Peter of old, we will say, I don't know the man. You will even swear that you don't know him. And when Peter came to that realization, he wept bitterly. And we need to weep bitterly. We need to acknowledge that we have been worse than Peter. Peter denied him three times. How many times have we denied him? Judas betrayed him. How many times have we betrayed him? And so if you're not suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because you're either ashamed of him or because you just don't want to lose your worldly connections. And Christ warns you that if you do that, you're not his, you're not one of his sheep, and that you will be held to account on the day of judgment. He goes on to say, blessed are you, in verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and they persecute you and they utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. Notice the reason, on my account. You see, when I go outside these four walls and I say, you know what, I believe that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. And they'll say, yeah, that's great, wonderful. You know, we support minority rights. We support, you know, we believe in supporting uh, groups like you because you guys are oppressed. Well, I, I follow the Buddha. Well, that's wonderful. We're glad to hear that. Uh, I follow Jesus Christ. Really? Really? Are you one of those weirdos? You see, no one cares about Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or the Hindu sages or the religious leaders of the world's religions, but they hate Jesus Christ. And the reason they hate him is very simple, because one day they know they're going to face judgment, and they're going to face him. I don't hear the name Muhammad thrown around as a swear word outside these four walls. I don't hear Buddhists using Buddha's name as a swear word, but why is the name of Jesus Christ used as a swear word? In the media, in cartoons, on, in movies. I hear it all the time on street corners. Do people speak of their mothers that way? Do they use their mother's names as swear words? No. Why do they use Jesus' name as a swear word? Because 
Romans 1.30 says, the sign of unregenerate heart. The sign of an unregenerate heart, Paul says, they're God-haters. They're haters of God. They hate his law. The heart is so deceitfully wicked. The unregenerate heart is so dark, it is so evil, that it hates its maker, in whose image it has been made. And so the Lord Jesus says, look, people are going to hate you because of me. He said, if they've hated you, remember, it first hated me. I am not of this world. And I've called you out of the world. You're in the world, but you're not part of the world. You're not part of its, its system, its, its, its ideology, its worldview. And so, folks, this is why as Christians, we always feel like we're pilgrims in this world. We're just pilgrims passing through. This is not our eternal home. We're just passing through, just like Father Abraham, who lived in tents and who kept moving and moving as a nomad because he was trying to find a city whose builder was God, an everlasting city, that new Jerusalem that is to come, the new heaven and the new earth that is to come. But the Lord Jesus says, they're going to say all kinds of bad stuff against you. They're going to say all types of evil things on my account because of me, because it hates me. Look at verse 12. What should be the reaction of the believer? Should we put our heads down in shame and say, oh, my friends have they've all abandoned me. I'm not cool anymore. I'm not in the crowd anymore. I'm not with it. Jesus says, you know how you should react when people persecute you and hate you and slander you for my name's sake? He says, rejoice, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Our reaction should be to rejoice when we are persecuted. We should rejoice because we're counted worthy of suffering for his name. And then, Paul, then the Lord Jesus goes on to say, he says, not only is your reward great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Name me one prophet in the Bible who did not suffer persecution or death or slander or rejection. Name me one prophet. Why do you think the job position of prophet was not a coveted job position? People usually didn't want to become prophets. They didn't want to sign up for the job position of prophet. That's why when God called them, they were all making excuses. Remember when God told Moses? He says, I'm going to call you, I'm calling you, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and you're going to bring up my people, and you're going to show my power in Egypt. Oh, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slow of speech. I've never thought that about Moses. Did, did you, Morad, ever think that about Moses? I mean, Charlton Heston didn't even stutter in the Ten Commandments. And Moses was a great, from what I saw, Cecil DeMille's Ten Commandments, I mean, Moses was slow of speech. I mean, can you imagine Moses? Like, he was like Daffy Duck. He was stuttering. Lord, I'm a stutterer. You can't use me. I can't speak clearly. Use Aaron. Aaron, now Aaron, he's a, he's a great public speaker. He's a great orator. He's eloquent. And the Lord said, fine, I'll send both of you. And then Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the Lord comes and says, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were brought forth, I, I called you to be a prophet to the nations. And what did he say? Lord, I'm too young. I'm a young man. You know, Lord, I still got my whole life ahead of me. You know, I need to, I need to discover the world. I need to get my education done. I need to do this. I need to do that. And God is saying, I already called you to be a prophet. I knew this before you were even born. That's your calling, Jeremiah. And that's what we need to understand, brothers and sisters. We need to understand that when God called the prophets forward, the reason why they didn't want to be prophets is because they knew the cost involved. The cost was rejection, hatred, opposition, and sometimes death. And you see, the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet is very easy. In Luke's account, in Luke 11, Jesus says, he says, he says blessed are you when you're persecuted. And then he says, but woe unto you when men speak well of you. For this is how they treated the false prophets who came. They spoke well of them. That's why I get worried when people start talking very well about me because something's wrong. Jesus said, woe unto you when men speak well of you. This is how they spoke of the false prophets. And here's the difference, folks. The difference between a true prophet and a false prophet is very simple. A true prophet will always tell you what you need 
to hear. A false prophet will tell you what you want to hear. You know what the false prophet will tell you? God doesn't want you to be sick. You're a child of the king. You should always be healthy. If you are sick, it's a sign of lack of faith. It's Satan's attack on your life. Or they'll say, you shouldn't be poor. You should be rich. You should name it and claim it. They will tell you that such and such a person is is, is going to win the next election. How many people came forward? How many Christian charismatic teachers said, Donald Trump's going to win the next election? And said, God told them. That's what people want to hear. Our kingdom, the kingdom of God. What did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight in a military, physical battle. And so, folks, the prophets always tell you what you need to hear. If you ever go to a church where the pastors always tell you what you want to hear, like you're wonderful. You're, you're, you know, God owes you big time. You know, you're so good that God would even sign his signature on your Bible. Don't you know how precious you are? And they will just build your ego and tell you God, is, God loves and loves and loves. God is a love. But he's like that ever-ready bunny who just keeps loving and loving like a toothless grandfather. But here's the problem. They never tell you about God's wrath against sin. They never tell you how repugnant sin is to God. They never tell you about the eternal separation from God, eternal punishment, because they're too busy telling you how wonderful God is and how much he loves you, when God's number one attribute is not love. God's number one attribute is holiness. It's his holiness. That's why he's called holy over and over and over and over and over again. That's why the death of Christ was necessary, because of the holiness of God, because of sin in the presence of God. And then he says this. He goes on to use two metaphors of, of, of what the church should look like. Look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be trampled under people's feet. Did you notice Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth? He didn't say you're the sugar of the earth. You're not the sweetener. A lot of us think we're sweet, right? We're not the sweetener. See, here's the problem. A lot of churches have so many sugar-coated messages that Christians are getting spiritual diabetes. They're feeding on so much sugar from the pulpit that they are going spiritually blind because diabetes can cause blindness if it's untreated. And so, if you keep feeding a kid all Henry bars and Mars bars and candy and popcorn and you just give them junk, what's going to happen? They're going to become very physically unhealthy. If we keep giving Christians sugar-coated messages and give them spiritual candy all the time, they're not going to grow into maturity in Christ. They're going to become obese, overweight, spiritual people who are very unhealthy. You see, folks, we're not called into the world to be a sweetener. We're called to be salt. And salt, we take that for granted today, but salt in the ancient world was extremely, extremely important. It was a very precious commodity. It was so precious that even the Romans, the Romans would be paid in salt money. That's where we get the word salary from today. You know when you get your salary? You know why we call it a salary? Well, the word S-A-L is the Latin word for salt. You know? Do you guys like salami? Right? No Italians here today. Any Italians here? No? Nobody? No Italians? No. How you doing? How you doing, Morad? You doing okay? No? Okay. If I was Italian, I would say, hey, you know, we like a salami. Well, what is salami? Well, salami means salted meat. Right? S-A-L. Sal. Right? And so, you need to understand that to the first century, salt was so precious because you see, people didn't have refrigerators. You didn't go and put your foot in refrigerators in the first century. You, you salt them. You salt meat. You salt fish. That's how you would preserve food. And so salt is a preservant. It preserves. And Jesus is saying to us, he says, you, you all, right? So the word you here is a second person plural. What that means is Jesus is speaking, let's say, let me just borrow a Texan euphemism. Jesus is saying, you all are the salt of the earth. You all, y'all, our southern neighbors have that pretty down pat. He says, you all, the church, you are the salt of the earth. 
You are a preserving agent in this world. As this world is going to hell in a handbasket, and you see it, folks, there's signs of judgment all around us. If you don't see it, it's all there. There's a darkness out there that you can grope. God is sending a strong delusion that they may believe a lie so that he will bring judgment on them for denying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't see delusion out there, just look at what's going on in our world. Look at the media. Look at the the logic that they're using to justify things. There is no logic. It's all about power over truth. It's not truth over power. It's power over truth. It's dictatorship. It's authoritarian, totalitarian rule. These are dark days. These are adulterous days. These are days like we've never seen worldwide. Pandemic affecting the whole world at the same time. Jesus says you're the salt. You're the preserving agent. You want to know why, you want to know why God has not overthrown this country like he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah? Because the church is the preserving agent in the world. She is his witness in the world. She is the body of Christ, the tangible expression of his body on the earth, called to minister to the world. And so salt doesn't just preserve things. What does salt also do? Salt also heals. And so when you get your wisdom teeth extracted, what do your dentists tell you? Go home and you are supposed to gargle with salt water. When you go into the ocean, the salt water is therapeutic. Salt has a healing agent. It has a disinfecting agent. That's why in the ancient world they would use salt or wine to disinfect wounds. And so as the church, we are the healing agent of God in the world. What are you doing with your church? Are are you guys a salty church? Are you guys losing your saltiness? Because if you're losing your saltiness, then just like salt is worthless if it's not salty, if the church doesn't be the church, if she's not the church and she's not salty, he's going to shut you down. And And I'm talking about the government. God will shut you down. Christ will shut you down. So you're the healing agent. You're the preserving agent. But salt is something else. It's a spice. So when you're eating some food, you go, you know what, these fries, they taste pretty bland. What do you do? You grab some salt, boom, miracle. It tastes like heaven. Salt adds spice to food. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, my message, my good news, my gospel brings spice to life. You know, our brother Morad was saying about how people today, the, the, the suicide rates are on the rise. Anxiety disorders are on the rise. People are locked up in their homes. They're cooped up in their homes. The the healthy are being quarantined, whether the Bible says very clearly that you only quarantine the sick. You don't quarantine healthy people. That's very dangerous to do that. It's psychologically damaging. And so Jesus is saying, look, my message brings hope to the world. Because when you find Christ, it's like the lights go on. You see the world through different lenses. Everything is new. The old has gone. All things become new. And you begin to realize, I'm not a mistake. I'm not just an evolutionary mistake that came from the seas, from the, from the, from the, the seas to the, the ooze, to the zoo, to you. But that you are a person made in God's image, that you are loved, that your life has meaning and purpose in this world. And so we go out there and we tell people, your life has meaning. You're not a piece of junk. You're not a blob of protoplasm. You're image bearers of God. And God has a message for you. And the message is the gospel. That God loved the world so much. He gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's good news, man. That's what this world needs. All we're hearing is bad news on the radio, the internet, the the newspapers, all we keep hearing is bad news. But Jesus comes along and Jesus opens our eyes and, and I was once dead, as John Newton said in his great hymn, Amazing Grace, I was once blind, but now I see. I was once lost, but now I'm found. There's one thing that Newton said near the end of his life. He says, I don't remember very much anymore. His mind was going, his memory was going. But John Newton says, but I remember two important things. I am a great sinner, but Christ is a greater Savior. 
That brings meaning to life. Well, what else does salt do? Well, when you eat too much salted food, do you ever notice what happens? You get thirsty. You want water. You want to satiate that thirst because when you eat a lot of salty foods, naturally the body wants to be rehydrated. And so what does the message of Jesus do? The message of Jesus is supposed to make people thirsty. They want more. Tell me more about this, Jesus. Tell me more about this eternal life. Tell me more about this forgiveness. Could God love me, such a wicked, wretched sinner? Yes, he can. So people become thirsty. But you see, brothers and sisters, don't lose your saltiness. If you're losing your saltiness, you're worthless. Then this place just becomes a social club. It's no different than any other social club. If people come here and they're hearing a message that they hear on Oprah Winfrey, then why are we here? We have the answer. We have the cure. We are that salt. Then you notice in verse 16, he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. What a, what a powerful statement. You are the light of the world. What was the first thing that God created in the book of Genesis? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the very first words out of God's mouth, the Hebrew says, Vayomer Elohim yehi or, ve yehi or. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God separated the light from the darkness. And Jesus comes on the scene, and in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. And whoever, whoever believes in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then when he takes residence in us, in our hearts, we become lights. So think of the moon. We think, you know, we think of the moon, and the moon, as we know, is a satellite. And we look up at the night, and sometimes when the skies are clear, we go, wow, what a beautiful moon. It's, it's full, it's gorgeous, it emits this beautiful light. But, you know, the moon does not have any light. It has no inherent light. It's, it's quite an ugly satellite, just filled with pot marks. And the light that you're seeing is not the light of the moon. It's the light of the sun that shines on the moon. And even though we have no light in ourselves, Christ is the son of righteousness. And he lights on us. He makes his light shine on us, and we reflect his light. And so Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. And when the world is dark, the only thing that vanquishes the darkness is the light. You are light. Light is the most basic form of energy in the universe. The photon, the most basic form of energy in the universe. That's why it's one of the very first things that comes out of God's mouth, let there be light. And so what that means is to those who walk in darkness, they need that light. So what are you doing with that light? Do you notice what Jesus says? He says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And it's so true. You know you're approaching a big city when you're on a, a, a country highway, and all of a sudden you see these lights coming up in the distance, and you could, oh, there it is, it's Markham or it's Toronto. You can tell because there's light, it emits light. It's a signal saying, hey, there's a big city over here. And then he goes on to say, he says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Of course, no one lights a light and puts it under the bed. That's counterintuitive. So what are we doing with our light? We're taking that light, and we're hiding it. And then we've got to keep hearing that song from the children's rhyme, Sunday school, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. So simple, so basic, but so true. But why do we hide our light? Are you hiding your light? Are you hiding it? Why? You don't want people to see? Are you too embarrassed? Light is meant to be shone, not to be hidden. 
And that's why Jesus makes that reference there to people don't light a light and put it under a basket. They put it on a stand so that he may give light to all those in the house. Are we letting our light shine? And then he puts this statement in there. He says, in the same way, verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see. Notice the reference to seeing. This thing about light, folks, if, there is, if we were in pitch darkness right now, you would not be able to see anything. If there was no, no light around, everything is pitch darkness, you would not be able to see at all. And you've probably been in situations like that where you may be in your room and the power goes out and it's pitch darkness and, and, and maybe all the blinds are closed. You can't make out any light. And that's a scary feeling. The thing about light is this. C.S. Lewis hit, a, hit the nail on the head. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He says, I believe in Christianity the same way I believe that the sun rises every day. He says, I can't all look directly at the sun, because if I do, obviously, it'll burn my retina. I can't look directly at the sun, but without it, I cannot see anything. And so, without God, we cannot see anything. We cannot have this conversation that we're having. The very fact that I'm using logic and words and reason is because there is this eternal logos, there's this eternal word who is the foundation of order and reason, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Garage, I become a car. Or I go to McDonald's, I become a Big Mac. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You go to church because you are a Christian. And so, just like Judas Iscariot, who walked with the Lord for three years, saw his miracles, ate with him, saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, heard his teachings. For three years, he walked with the Lord, with the other apostles. And in the end, the Lord Jesus could say, all of you are clean except one of you. One of you is a diabolos, a devil. And he was speaking of Judas Iscariot. He had all the right words. Believe in Jesus. Hung out with him. We went to synagogue on Shabbat. Jesus says, you're not mine. Look at your heart. Look at your works. They betray your confession. And so today, there are a lot of people in the church who, they're just there because their parents bring them there. They're just there because they were, it's just tradition. That's no different than the Muslim says, well, I was raised as a Muslim, and therefore my parents taught me Islam, therefore Islam must be true. doesn't logically follow. That doesn't mean you have the truth. And so Jesus said that his kingdom would look like a field worth wheat and weeds would grow among them and he would let them grow together and now on the day of judgment he compares it to a harvest he says when he comes he will separate the wheat from the tares and he'll take the wheat into his barn he'll throw the tares into the fire or he says it'll be like a shepherd when the son of man comes and he sits on the throne of his glory he will bring, bring all the nations before him and he will separate them like a, sh a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats and the sheep, he will say, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from, from the foundation of the world. And to the goats, he will say, depart from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire. But Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did all these wonderful things in your name. Depart from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Serious stuff, boys and girls, including myself. Talk to myself, not just to you. I'm talking to myself. This is serious stuff. Following Jesus Christ is until, you know, I wrote my name on a, uh, a chick track at the back or I made a decision and I wrote my name. That's, that's not what makes you a Christian. Following Christ is so serious that he said that whoever is willing to follow after me must take up his cross daily and deny himself and herself and follow me. And the only people who carry their crosses are those who are condemned to die. If you saw anyone carrying a cross in the first century, you would say, I pity that person because they're on their way to death. And Christ says, I want you to die every day to me. Every day you take that cross and you follow after me. What does that mean? You deny yourself. It's not about you. 
It's not about my buddies. It's not about my designer clothes. It's not about the car I drive. It's not about my reputation. It's all about him. It's Christ over all. If Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So Jesus invites us to show that light, to show that light so people may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So at this time, this whole thing with COVID and so forth, people for the first time, probably in a very long time, are beginning to realize and consider their mortality. And so this is a grand opportunity for us as the church, as the light of the world, as the salt of the earth. It is our opportunity to give people a hope that life, even though it is more precious than death, the fact of the matter is Christ has conquered death. Christ has risen from the grave. And death is not to be feared. John Wesley once said about those Christians in his churches who would face death at the end of their life, he said, our people die well because they have their hope set on Christ. And it is isn't ironic, folks, that today, as so many people are trying to save their lives and we have to stay at home and we're all in this together, which we're not. Those are all lies. We're not all in this together. People are saying, well, we want to, we, we want to save lives. And yet, our government murders the unborn in the womb, in the hundreds of thousands. The United States, the new President Biden is now going to refund Planned Parenthood. It's not about life. They don't care about the sacredness of life, the sanctity of life. It has nothing to do with that. Because if it did, they would be protecting the most vulnerable, the unborn. But interestingly enough, Jesus says this. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. The more you try to save your life, the higher the chances you're going to lose it. Because you see, folks, what does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul. And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So these are questions that, that are being asked today. And so now is the time. Don't be discouraged. Don't be distraught. And if the church has to go through persecution, then so be it. Let it be so for the glory of God. Let it be for the sake of the gospel. Our master went before us, and our master hung between heaven and earth on a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, stark naked, lacerated, his body lacerated by the Roman scourge. He hung there for you and for me, and he was not ashamed. Why should we be ashamed of him? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. May we too, for the joy that is set before us in Christ, may we too endure our crosses. And never forget, brothers and sisters, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. May we go out into that world. There is the mission field. And may the Lord Jesus Christ be proclaimed as the Savior of all sinners. Thank you and God bless.